For those of you who've never been to Cannes before, Cannes is certainly the largest and generally considered to be the premier awards show in the advertising and marketing industry. Cannes Lions takes place once a year uh, in June in the city of Cannes in the south of France um, in a very beautiful setting. In fact, the festival is, is, um, is, uh, takes place in a, in a conference center called the Palais, which is at the end of a very long boardwalk uh, called the Croisette that snakes along the coastline. And you have these amazing hotels on the one side and these beautiful beaches um, on the other. So it really is quite an idyllic setting. At its heart, um, this week of Can Lions is really uh, about awards. It's an awards show. In particular, it is a week um, of award ceremonies that rewards everything from television and print to outdoor, cyber, mobile, direct, creative effectiveness. This year, they added um, an innovation category, 17 categories uh, in total. So really, every aspect of the marketing um, and advertising industry. Can has uh, famously always been about the parties. So, um, you know, parties that would start in the morning and in that beautiful environment go all the way through the day, into the night, and often through to the next morning again. But I've been going to Cannes for 10 years now, and what I've seen is a very definite shift from the party culture to a learning culture. And this is a, this, this is a really important um, statement about where our industry is at. So, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, winning a Can Lion was hard. You needed to do great creative work. But in, in, in many ways, the canvas on which you did that work was pretty contained. It was a TV ad, or it was a print ad, or it was outdoor, or it was a combination. But today, the rate of change that's taking place in media and advertising is such that you are constantly having to innovate and evolve, evolve and invent. And as a result, people in our industry realize that they have to stay abreast of new thinking. And so with that amount of change, Cannes has really become more about the seminars than the parties. As usual, these uh, seminars you know, are... are um, made up of hundreds of speakers, and as usual, there was a star-studded cast, so some pretty funny people this year. Uh, Conan O'Brien, Jack Black, Annie Leibovitz, um, Sean Coombs, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, I don't know what to call him anymore, but uh, one of those names, Lou Reed, and many other, many other celebrities. There were also what I refer to as the luminaries, people who um, are not as well known, but who have something really profound to say about our industry and the world in general. So, for example, Richard Dawkins, who is the author of a book called The God Delusion, uh, he was speaking about the notion or the word meme and how that word has evolved. And in fact, Richard Dawkins invented the word meme before it was hijacked by the internet generation. Um, Vivian Westwood was there. I must say, I never realized what a thought leader she was. For those of you who didn't know, she actually invented the anarchy symbol many years ago, and she's still very much a punk at heart. Um, and uh, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, who I think probably has a deeper understanding of the participative nature um, of the industry that we work in today than, than anyone else. So this was the 60th year of Can Lions, and as such, uh, it was the biggest um, festival that there's been, over 35,000 entries across 17 different categories, 11,000 delegates from 90 different countries, and about 150 learning sessions. So uh, workshops, master classes, tech talks, seminars. And what I did is I went to as many of those seminars, tech talks, and workshops as I could. And I listened, and I take all of that information, and I've tried to distill it down into a handful of trends and themes. And I've then taken the best work of the year and attached that to those trends to demonstrate how they're playing out in the real world. And I condense all of that into an hour, uh, which is virtually impossible, and which is why I call it Can in a Can, which I think is a clever name. <laughs> Okay, so without, uh, without any further ado, let's dive into what those trends were. So I think the first thing at the heart of every conversation was a realization of the fact that our industry exists at the intersection between culture and technology. And the rate of change that is taking place in both popular culture and technology is such that it's triggering or sparking uh, what was being referred to as a next creative revolution or a second creative revolution. Now, I think many people um, uh, realize that advertising initially, before television, was a very information-based 
uh, form of communication. So your main media channels was, were press, newspapers, um, and as a result, most advertising was features and benefits oriented. The birth of television triggered what is commonly referred to as the creative revolution because suddenly advertising moved from being information-based to being entertainment-based. Well, the participative nature of the internet and interactive technology is triggering a next creative revolution. As the organizers of the TED seminar said, in a time where disciplines cross-pollinate and technology and creativity are colliding in new and thought-provoking provoking ways, we find ourselves at the brink of another creative revolution. And the guys from RGA kind of went a little further in describing that. They said, an era defined by the storytelling power of television is giving way to a world where media does more than entertain. It informs, connects, and it enables. So with the kind of a next or second creative revolution at the heart of everything, there was obviously a fair amount of sort of rebellious spirit in the air. And so on the final night when, when one particular piece of work, which I'll show you a little later, won its Grand Prix, about 30 people went on stage to, to, to um, get the award. And in amongst them was some guy holding a cardboard placard, and on it, it said, fuck advertising. Now, that's a pretty provocative thing to do at the world's largest advertising and marketing event. But what was important for me about the stunt was that it was actually reflective of a common theme that I heard throughout the week. So Crispin Porter said it a little more politely or appropriately, whatever you prefer. They said we need to rediscover a healthy disregard for advertising. And what do they mean by that? They said that we need to do that because advertising is not moving at the speed of culture anymore. And unless we can start to move at the speed of culture, we will become increasingly irrelevant. So in fact, they differentiate between advertising and what they call hacking. And this notion of hacking became quite a commonly used phrase at Cannes uh, this year. They believe that hacks are more powerful than ads because they are effective and they put people in the center. But I think that, in fact, the guys from Dentsu explain the difference between hacking and advertising uh, in a clearer fashion. They say <clears throat> that hacking is about experimentation. Now, advertising, in truth, has never been about experimentation. We do research, we plan, and then we put something into the market. Today, by the time you get to market, the stuff that you've researched may have already changed. So experimentation is becoming a much more appropriate way forward. Open source innovation. Hacking is about open source innovation. Advertising and marketing has never been about open source innovation. It's been about closed communities trying to generate solutions. It's also been about very structured partnerships where hacking is about fluid relationships. And these are the things that we need to move towards if we want to move at the speed of culture. Now, a second uh, trend, certainly I think in every industry, but in advertising and marketing too, is the, is the, the hunger for innovation. Well, innovation came uh, under attack too. So in the party seminar, I saw a big slide that said, fuck innovation. Now, party are an innovation agency, so um, they obviously aren't anti-innovation. Um, what they do realize, though, is that innovation is not an end in itself. Innovation isn't everything, they said. Emotion is everything. And we have to use the right technology to bring the right idea to life. So in another seminar, I got a really cool free T-shirt, which said on it, Good technology is no excuse for a bad idea. And I think more and more people realize that technology and innovation are only worthwhile. They only have value if we're applying them for the right reasons. Innovation that doesn't seek to improve people's lives is just innovation for the sake of innovation. So what we were seeing in this rebellious spirit and this kind of this attack on advertising and innovation was not an attack on advertising and innovation at all. It was an attack on purposelessness and a call for purpose. And this word purpose is becoming increasingly important uh, in advertising and marketing and business as a whole, I believe. So as Dr David Droger said, we begin the creative process by asking what purpose does it serve? And the great thing is that technology can help us to create that purpose. It can help us to create shared value. So in the past, when all we did from a marketing point of view was make TV ads and make uh, print ads and billboards, it was much harder to create shared value for, for values for consumers. By no means impossible, but much harder. With technology at our disposal, it's easy to create utilities um, and, and other value for consumers. 
The guys at Shield talk about the need to move beyond simply pushing products um, and, and to instead try to increase your brand's share of consumers' everyday lives. So they talk about moving away from what we've, what, you know, the holy grail that we used to have, which was mind share, towards this notion of life share. You don't just want your brand to be a part of your consumers' thinking. You actually want it to be a part of their daily lives. Now, Ivan Pollard from Coca-Cola, and you'll see as I go through the presentation today, Coca-Cola uh, are, uh, are, are, are going to be a recurring theme because, in fact, they won the Creative Marketer of the Year Award this year, and a lot of their work points to, to where the future is going. But as Ivan Pollard said, I think very, uh, very aptly, our brands must increasingly be and do before they have the right to say. So the first reference that I want to show you um, is a piece of work that is filled with purpose, but I've chosen this piece of work because actually it isn't technology. Uh, it isn't um, driven by digital. It's an old-fashioned billboard, except instead of it just being a billboard, by adding a third dimension, they've managed to instill a sense of purpose in the advertising itself. Take a look. So a really smart piece of work, one that delivers shared values to consumers. But I think um, what, what was very clear in many of the seminars this year is that this notion of purpose is not just about creating value in the lives of individual consumers, but about creating value for the community or the society as a whole. Um, and this idea of social purpose or shared values or brand ideals, whatever one wants to call them, is becoming a more and more prevalent part of every conversation uh, within environments like CAN. So as David Droger says, as creative people and problem solvers, we have a responsibility. Uh, his counterparts at Dentsu agree. They say, we want to come up with ideas that can change society, not just sell cars. As Jonathan Mildenhall from Coca-Cola says, we believe that all brands should lean in to making a social difference. Um, and as Joe Tripodi, their CMO, adds, we used to focus, he says, on functional benefits. Then we moved to emotional benefits. And then they started to focus on what they call cultural leadership. And to, to Coca-Cola, cultural leadership is the ability to shine a light on important issues because they've realized that as a brand, it is vital for them to have a point of view. Um, many of these conversations are underpinned by, um, by thinking that, that has been put forward over the last few years. Jim Stengel, who used to be uh, the CMO of Procter & Gamble, wrote a book called Grow. And in Grow, he shows how the, the notion of a brand ideal or shared values is not a, a, a CSI initiative. It's not about um, so corporate social responsibility. It's about powering a business's growth by underlining its, its uh, primary or fundamental purpose. And in his book, he did a study which showed that the 50 leading brands that demonstrate social purpose 
outperformed the S&P 500 by four times. And so there is a, an increasing understanding, I think, among marketers of leading international brands, that social purpose, a brand purpose, shared values with your customers are absolutely key to building bonds. So this is a piece of work that Coca-Cola did, uh, which is really a demonstration of their commitment to social purpose. And it's a vending machine that changed the world. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of lows. It's stressful, it's tense. It seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that, we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the barbed in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they've been drained in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet them, they realize, you know what, you're just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad, because together I think we would do wonders. where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, gestures, and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there. The whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words, and that action speaks louder than anything else. This is what we're supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about you know how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness. Humanity, this is what we want, more and more exchange. It's such a great example of what can be done. I mean, Coca-Cola could have created a vending machine to sell cans of Coke, or they could have created a vehicle to change people's lives that expresses the fundamental ethos of their brand, and in so doing, create content that is both remarkable and shareable. So another example in the area of social purpose is one that is actually quite reminiscent of something you guys did a few years ago. You'll remember your billboard that generated solar power. Uh, well, here's another quite interesting version of that kind of thinking. UTech, the University of Engineering and Technology, was about to open the application period for 2013, so they needed to call students' attention. Lima and its surrounding villages are located in the coastal desert of Peru. In this place, there are many people suffering from the lack of potable water. The presence of rain in this region is almost zero, but the atmospheric humidity is about 98%. Inspired by this, we worked as a team, UTEC and the agency, to build the first billboard that produces drinking water out of air. The billboard has a unique technology that captures the air humidity and turns it into drinking water. Cada tanque almacena el promedio de 20 litros 
las cinco máquinas van a hacer este proceso y se va a almacenar todo en un solo tanque. The billboard has already produced thousands of liters of drinking water. That equals the water consumption of hundreds of families per month. No, que pongan en diferentes lugares, ¿no? Si es posible en cada anexo, en cada caserío, en cada pueblo, para que el agua sea generada por medio de los paneles. Un agua que real, realmente nos da vida, ¿no? So while there was all this kind of rebellious spirit against advertising and, and innovation, there was a simultaneous return to the fundamentals of what marketing is all about, story. So as Matt Cato said, 10,000 years of human experience proves that the most successful messaging will always be the telling of stories. And I think there was, there was such a, a, um, a focus on, on this notion of story because I think that everyone today understands that regardless of what part of the marketing ecosystem you serve, we are all in the business of storytelling. Why? Because brands fundamentally are storytellers. That's what we do and that's how we build what we are. So there was a lot of conversation around story and the idea of storytelling. Um, but I think that Sapient made a really interesting distinction when they spoke about the difference between storytelling and story yelling. So story yelling, according to them, is when you just shout out your message without any concern for whether or not you've actually made a connection with the people you're talking to. As David Weldon said, the best work builds emotional bonds. Messaging is secondary. Because those emotional bonds are the conduit through which your messages travel. If you don't make that connection, you're never going to get your message through anywhere. And I love the way PepsiCo put it. They said, emotional stories with a heightened sense of purpose are timeless. And for me, there was one piece of work that demonstrated this better than any other, a piece of work that is undoubtedly an emotional story with a heightened sense of purpose. And it's the next generation of a campaign by Dove. I'm a forensic artist. Work for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them. They couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. Mm -hmm. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that 
we do like. It's really a, a beautiful piece of work. And one of the reasons that I think there's, you know, this focus on story and storytelling is that we live in a world that is, is bursting with content. I mean, there's a, an enormous amount of branded content on every platform. I um, mean, in fact, Mark Tutsell, who's the chairman of the direct jury, said this year that brilliant content is the new currency. And what was really interesting for me about that is that that was coming from the chairman of the direct jury, because even in direct marketing, brilliant content turned out to be the new currency. As the guys from Proximity said, in fact, it is culture plus content that creates those connections um, with the audience. And as a result, brands are transforming into a mix of media, technology, and entertainment companies. Back in 2009, Tom Ferensky said, every company is a media company. And I think that's really becoming very clear today. In a world where, as brands, we are creating our own media channels every day, we are creating content, not just advertising. In fact, every company is a media company. But if we're talking about branded content and we're talking about CAN 2013, there is only one reference that I can show you, a piece of work that has certainly taken the world by storm. Set fire to your hair Poke a stick at a grizzly bear Eat medicine that's out of date Use your private parts as piranha bait What's this red button do? Safe around trains, a message from Metro. What I want to show you is the case study, because as, as, as charming a piece of content as that is, the true impact is in how contagious and how viral this content turned out to be. Take a look. Young people don't listen to public safety messages, so how do you get them to stop being unsafe around trains? By making it the dumbest way to die. Dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. 
A song was written called Dumb Ways to Die. It was released as a YouTube video and within a week had over 20 million views and coverage on every television network in the country. A dedicated Tumblr site generated huge and immediate viral effect. Within days, Dumb Ways to Die became the world's most shared video, beating out another music video released on the same day, Rihanna's Diamonds. The song was released on iTunes and charted in 28 countries, and in some countries even making the top 10. Radio advertising was purchased, but this song about rail safety was so popular, radio stations played it for free. Not as an ad, but as part of their music programming. We published the little book of Dumb Ways to Die and distributed it in schools. We made a hugely popular smartphone game featuring all our characters. Outdoor advertising was created specifically to generate Instagram-friendly branded content. And at train stations, a karaoke version of the song played while posters visually reinforced the message. The results? People adopted the rail safety message like never before. Over 200 cover versions were made. Schools started using it as a teaching tool in classrooms. By taking a branded content rather than an advertising approach, Dumb Ways to Die became the most shared public service campaign in history. And most important of all, the Metro has seen a 21% reduction in accidents and deaths compared to the same time last year. Be safe around trains, a message from Metro. So this piece of work ended up winning over 20 lions across 10 categories and half a dozen Grand Prix. And at the beginning of the week when it won its first Grand Prix, I, I sat in the audience and I kind of thought, you know, it's a cool little video, but does it really deserve a Grand Prix? A, a couple of days later, I was having a Skype call to my kids in Cape Town and my daughter said, hey, Dad, I got a new game on my iPod called Dumb Ways to Die. And I thought, you know, a PSA in Australia has traveled all the way to South Africa and is in the hands of an eight-year-old girl. Pretty amazing stuff. So because of, of, of this focus on story and, and the proliferation of content, I think people are starting to realize that what we need to find are storyable ideas rather than just big ideas. So in the past, you know, you could, you could tell your story on one medium, like on television. Today, we're looking for ideas that can form the basis of stories that we can tell across multiple platforms. They need to be storyable. And to do that, you need an organizing idea, not just a big idea. Or as the guys from Sapiens say, we have to transform our storylines into immersive story systems. So there was also Tiffany Rolfe kind of uh, distinguished between storytelling and story doing. So according to her, story doing is about ideas that take brands beyond telling their story to actually living it. And this is important because our consumers will learn more from our experiences or from their experiences than they do just from stories. And so um, the sapient guys say we should move from storytelling to storyscaping with a storyscape being a landscape of both emotional and transactional experiences. And the way to do that is by experimenting in the combination of storytelling and technology. So a great uh, example of a brand that combines storytelling and technology to great effect uh, was Intel in association with Toshiba. They created a six-part series, uh, an amazing piece of work called The Beauty Inside. This is the strange story of Alex, a man who wakes up every day in a different body. And for a while, that was okay. Alex kept a daily record of his odd life on his computer, which accompanied him everywhere he went. One day, though, Alex fell in love. And that is when everything changed. How could he have a relationship if he always looked different on the outside? Yeah, I never had a girlfriend. We had girlfriends. A lot of girlfriends. Each one. Only for a night. The Beauty Inside, inspired by Intel Inside, featuring the Toshiba Ultrabook, starring Topher Grace, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and the audience. 
The movie was aired in six weekly episodes. And because Alex looked different every day, anyone in the audience could play him and be featured in the film. Each episode contained a few webcam diaries in which real fans actually wrote and acted out some of Alex's most intimate moments in the movie. I called her three times today. I hung up every time. And in the end, the audience helped give Alex hundreds of faces. This love story by two technology companies reached 70 million views. It got strangers discussing their own sense of identity. All while celebrating the fact that it's what's inside that counts. She was right. I would see her again. But she would never see me. So what's amazing about this piece of work is not that it's a narrative that invites participation from the audience. We've seen that before. What is amazing is the level of quality with which this is executed. So not only did this win a Grand Prix in the film category, it also won an Emmy Award. So here's a piece of branded content that invites participation from the audience that is actually at the same level of quality as the entertainment we choose to consume on television every day. So certainly what we see in that piece of work is participation. And participation is an increasingly important part of, uh, of the media landscape that we live in. So as Nick Law says, the success of this next creative revolution will be measured by participation. Because we need to move from a world of marketing to people to a world where people are marketing to one another on our behalf. The way to do that, though, is to provide a playground with the right toys and tools. As Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia says, if you want to encourage participation, everyone has to have a very good idea of what they are trying to accomplish. What Joe Tripodi from Coke calls freedom within a framework. And if we are to invite participation from our consumers, if we are to give them this playground and give them a clear idea of what we're trying to accomplish, give them freedom within a framework, we then as marketers and advertisers have to play the role of facilitator because all of their contributions must ultimately be additive. They must add to the brand. So in order to give them that freedom, we must give them a framework and we must facilitate the conversation. So Nick Law spoke a lot about this in, in his presentation, and he spoke about the fact that the first creative revolution was all about story. The second creative revolution is about participation. But in fact, the real opportunity is in the combination of those two things, looking for what he calls a whole idea. In the era of participation, he says, we shouldn't look for big ideas, we should look for whole ideas. Ideas that are, are purposeful, that have emotion and narrative at their core, but that are also participative. So for me, probably my favorite piece of work that is a demonstration of a whole idea is a campaign by Nike called Find Your Greatness. And I guess one of the reasons I love this piece of work is that um, in many ways it reminds me of what we all did with the Kiona team search recently. On July 31st, 2012, Nathan Sorrell, a 200-pound 12-year-old boy from London, Ohio, redefined the conventions of greatness in front of hundreds of millions of sports fans. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. All of us. Nathan did it on one of the biggest nights in sporting history. London 2012 set the stage for the most lucrative Olympics in IOC history, and Nike had big ambitions. Be the most talked about brand around the world by getting people to stop worshipping and start doing. Instead of leaning into the fanfare, Nike used the ultimate sporting stage to invite everyday people to get up off the couch and find their greatness. And in doing so, inspire and empower the next generation of athletes, reconnecting them with the brand. This wasn't about hero worshipping, it was about hero making. Instead of finding greatness on the podium in London, England, Nike found it in everyday people and places around the world. There are no grand celebrations here. No speeches, no bright lights. But there are great athletes. Through their social and digital communities, Nike invited the world to find their greatness. Using Nike Plus in Fuel, we encouraged people around the world to get moving, set goals, and log runs on their journey to greatness. 
The campaign got the world talking, but more importantly, it got people moving. This was the first time in the brand's history that Nike did not use elite athletes in their Olympic advertising. We proved to the world that if you have a body, you are indeed an athlete. First time in the brand's history that they didn't use elite athlete in their Olympic advertising. They've used technology to take the story back to the people, to their customers. So over the, over the last few years, uh, we've seen a lot of this participation arise out of a kind of a democratization of the means of production around content. So cheap video cameras, cheap editing equipment, um, easy access to distribution through platforms like YouTube. But what we're seeing now is a democratization, not only in the means of audiovisual production, but in the manufacturing process as well. And this is giving rise to what was called the maker generation. So as Victors and Spoils said, the latest obsession is making. And this is coming from new technologies like hardware prototyping and 3D printing, which are democratizing the manufacturing process. They're making it possible for ordinary people at home to make physical three-dimensional objects. You know, new, new little tools and technologies like Arduino, MakerBot, Shapeways, and Quirky are powering a do-it-yourself creativity that sits at the core of next generation social business. Because people are able to actually connect things to their friends, to their communities, and to their social networks. But for me, what's really interesting was um, a notion that that party raised, which is to say that with all of this new technology, these new ways to make, let's not just make new things, let's actually make new ways to make. In other words, let's not just use technology to innovate the work, let's innovate the process in order to create new things. And probably the biggest innovation around the process is this move from planning and executing to prototyping and evolving. A realization of the fact that the market is moving so fast that we need to get to the point where we are comfortable to create a minimum viable product, put it in the market, listen to what people say, react to the way they use it, and actually, actually evolve it and improve it over time. So with this explosion of, of kind of participation, there's obviously an explosion of user-generated stuff. And as a result, curation is becoming increasingly important. So as Nick Law said, we need to start thinking less about content creation and more about content curation because our ability to make content discoverable will be key. Customers around the world want to be informed and entertained on their own time and in their own way. And as Nick D'Alosio said, the next order of the web is going to be small again. So this guy, Nick D'Alosio, he uh, um, was the youngest person officially ever to get venture capital funding. He got the first round of VC funding um, in Silicon Valley at the age of 15. He went on to start a business called Sumly, which he sold to Yahoo, um, and he now works for Yahoo, and he was on the stage. He still looks 15. Um, but, but the amazing contribution that he's made to that business is to understand that users want content to be personalized, customized, and curated to their needs, and then summarized. So if there's a three-page article, um, Sumly will actually summarize it using an algorithm into a one-sentence uh, overview of what that content is so that you can access it, you can find it in your own time and in your own way. So we've spoken a lot about the sort of cultural trends emerging from this intersection between culture and technology. But of course, there are many changes taking place around the technology side of that equation too. And for me, perhaps the most interesting are the changes taking place in the human-computer interface. So as the guys from Contagious said, the new horizon in advertising will feel more like Star Trek than like Mad Men. And the reason for that is that we're starting to see, for example, uh, screens emerging on surfaces other than our, our laptops and our phones. We're already seeing gestural interfaces and voice recognition like Siri replacing key the keyboard and the mouse. The human body is becoming your primary interface with the computer and things like Connect and Connect 2.0 um, with advanced motion tracking are really starting to make this a reality. Wearable technology like Google Glass will change our interaction with the world around us. And if this sounds like science fiction, Credit Suisse uh, believes that within the next three years the wearable technology industry will be worth $50 billion. 
This is not science fiction. It is happening now, certainly in developed markets faster than in our own. But the human computer interface is changing and it will affect everything we do. At the core of that change is mobile, without a doubt. And I think everybody recognizes that. As 360i says, every moment is mobile. And for some demographics, it really isn't about mobile first. It's about mobile only. But as Frank Voris points out, we really shouldn't use the word mobile at all anymore. We should use the word mobility because it's not about the device. It's about the consumer and it's about their behavior. And in fact, Frank Voris says they don't think about mobile as a channel at all. They view it as a lifestyle. It's not another medium. It's the connective tissue that connects all of your other media and empowers and unlocks the potential of your other media. Because with mobile, we can tell stories, he says, in a three-dimensional way, with location, participation, and driven by data. So there are two examples that I'd like to show you here, one which is designed for smartphones and one which takes advantage of the proliferation of feature phones. The smartphone application is, is one of my favorites because it, it is driven by a sense of social purpose, uh, but it also uses technology in a, in a wonderfully innovative way. <laughs> Finder image. Double tap to take a picture. Uploading. Awaiting reply. Small stream in the foreground. Shape an extra fly. To your left, I see red tulips blooming. There's a group of runners stretching and warming up. are from Australia and they look very fresh. I see a great buy. You should get them. Don't be afraid, just eat our Uploading. Awaiting reply. The second example is a piece of work that um, was designed for an emerging market much like our own that doesn't have access to smartphones. For Philippine public schools, textbooks have become a burden. Sa laki na sa dami ng mga libro, nabibiform tuloy physically ang mga bata. Kung ito sa school, pag good class na, gumayin ko na hindi na lang to work. But while developed countries have solved this problem through tablets and e-readers, for these families, even the cheapest models cost more than their whole monthly income. In fact, the only gadgets most of them own are old analog mobile phones used mainly for texting. Then we realized, what if we could use these millions of old phones to create a new brand of textbook? Smart, the country's largest telecom, took its mission to make text light and easy further than ever. As we introduced smart textbooks. Over six months, we collaborated with respected textbook publishers to condense official school texts from in-class lesson guides to homework exercises into 160 character text messages. Smart then programmed these texts into the inboxes of thousands of inactive surplus SIM cards, which were then repackaged into new smart textbooks. We launched them in partner schools that needed it most 
where the simple and in fact low-tech solution made a profound sustainable impact. It turned even the oldest phones into a new kind of e-reader and old SIM cards into a new brand of textbook. So less effort was spent carrying and storing books and far more effort learning from them. With petitions and pledges from more schools and education sector members, Smart Textbooks is going even further. With plans already underway for more subjects and grade levels, kits so schools themselves can reproduce Smart Textbooks for free, and best of all, a rollout across the entire Philippines. Well, we always like to be at the cutting edge of an innovation, particularly relevant innovation. I want to see how this thing moves forward. Bala araw, we'll be bringing out still a lot of tablets, pero sa ngayon, eh, dapat simulan natin. Ito ang pinaka-perfect na simula ito, kung yun ito na smart ito. Fulfilling Smart's mission to make every kind of text light and easy for all. So one of the, uh, the byproducts or effects of, of the, the mobile revolution is an explosion uh, of data, what's being referred to as big data. And in fact, it is social media and mobile that is contributing uh, to this explosion of data. And as John Kennedy from IBM says, this is allowing marketers to understand their consumers as individuals. And I really like the way he put it when he said, before big data, knowing the customer was like having a low-res picture of them. But... It's imperative for companies to now start turning their big data into smart data. And how do we do that? By using data to go beyond selling products and services to creating ongoing and meaningful exchanges with our consumers. Because as David Weldon says, our industry believes that if we shoot messaging at the right target, we'll score. Well, that's not true. It's, about, it's not about creating messages, it's about forging emotional connections. Again, referring to those emotional connections as the conduit through which our messaging will travel. So one of the, the, the big trends and conversations this year as, r- arising as a result of big, ta- big data was what's being referred to as the quantified self. Now, the quantified self emerges out of things like Mint, for example, that gives you an understanding of all of your financial data, or like your Nike Nike Plus fuel band that lets you know how much activity you've expended during the day. All of this data makes me quantified. It makes me able to quantify my activity. But what's starting to happen is that because consumers have their data quantified, they also have control of that data. And this is giving rise to what Nick Law refers to as the qualified self. And the qualified self really refers to a world in which our consumers are quantified, their data is known to them, but in which they own that data and they decide what data to share with brands um, that they interact with. Now, this really is a democratization of data that is going to further change the relationship between brands and consumers. And he suggests that all brands should really think about what the world will be like when consumers own and control their own data. The other impact or side effect of of all of this data, of course, is our ability to demonstrate effectiveness. So as Adobe said, we need to use data to demonstrate impact. And as we start to use technology in this way, in fact, the CMO will have a better view of the business than the CFO. And marketing will move from being a business expense to being a business driver. And as that starts to happen, agencies like ourselves will certainly need to become more and more obsessed with the outcome rather than the output that we make. Fortunately, this isn't a a kind of a, a choice between creativity and effectiveness, because as Joe Tripodi says, with the more data they look at, the more, um, the more assured they are that there is a direct line of sight between creativity and effectiveness. But another and perhaps even more important kind of byproduct of all of this data is the ability and as a result the necessity for us to be increasingly responsive as well. So as Mindshare says, being more adaptive will make you more creative. And as an industry, we have to learn that when you put something out there, that's not the end, it's just the beginning. And it doesn't matter if you get it wrong, as long as you are adaptive and responsive enough to make changes. Now what that means is that we as agencies and you and clients have to change our view 
of what failure is and what success is. Because in a world where you're prototyping and evolving, a world where you're creating a minimum viable product and then refining it, you have to change your view of what success and failure are. And we have to move to far more fluid relationships between us so that we can react in real time. Because as the guys from Dentsu say, you have to walk hand in hand with the clients to be able to seize the cultural moments that are happening all the time. So for me, one of the great examples of, of, a, of a brand that really took advantage of this is Oreos. It's a very old brand um, who used responsiveness to connect with a new generation of customers. Little girls have pretty curls, but I like Oreos. Oreo recently celebrated a big birthday, really big. Turning 100 can mean just one thing. You're old, really old. Unless you give it a twist. The Oreo Daily Twist. A simple idea to make this old brand a vital part of pop culture, the digital world, and everyday conversation all at once. A hundred pieces of content created in a hundred days. In honor of the hundredth birthday. 100% responsive. Here's how it worked. Every morning we searched for what people were talking about. Once concepts were developed, there was a full production team waiting to execute. By 6 p.m., we pushed the day's twist out to Oreo's 30 million Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter followers and archived it on Oreo's online hub. How do we kick it off? Well, maybe you heard about that. Oreos are gay. <laughs> Monday night, Oreo posted this on their Facebook page. New rule, wing nuts have to stop saying they're going to boycott Oreos because they made a gay cookie. But we didn't stop there. And neither did the fans. In just 100 days, we turned an old cookie into an icon. Oreo didn't just reflect the news, it became the news. And we made 100 years old look pretty young. So what I, what I really love about that piece of work is just the, the way it indicates the future of how all brands will have to um, work in the consumer space with their, their consumers in future. So what we're seeing with, with all of these um, trends is, a, is certainly a redefinition of advertising and in many ways a redefinition of creativity itself. And one of the reasons for that is that, as Jimmy Wales says, talent is more widely distributed than anyone initially realized. The Mad Men model of one genius spark from a small group of people is no longer the best model. And as the Crispin Porter guys say, we have to break the muscle memory of what advertising is by bringing in new people from outside the industry. Coke kind of expands that thinking uh, when they say that actually what we have to create is an ecosystem of partners so we can tap into the best ideas. Partnerships will be key to creativity. And one of the reasons for this is that as brands, we have to understand that we don't build our brands through our advertising anymore. We build it through every touch point that our consumers have with the brand, from the in-branch experience to the ATM experience to the way they receive um, their credit card or anything else that they do is the way the brand is created. And as a, as a result, to make that a seamless user journey that reflects the brand we're trying to build, we need to have the right strategic alliances. And this redefinition, uh, redefinition of creativity, in fact, is leading to a redefinition of business as a whole. Because in order to create a seamless user journey, um, you have to deal with multiple touch points within the company. Because in many instances, uh, many of these touch points are a separate silo within the company. Um, IDEO, who is probably the, uh, one of the most highly regarded innovation agencies in the world, they said that when they work with new clients, they get them all into the room, the CMO, the CTO, the CEO, and they say, if you guys want to work with us, first of all, you have to work together. So we're going to try that with our clients too. I don't know if it all work. And the reason they do that is because they remind us that marketing is not about what you want to sell. 
It's about you, how you want to grow. And one of the, the, the best tools that we have um, to do all of this is digital because digital allows us to create transformation and change. And certainly what we are moving towards is a new age of technology-driven business transformation. So I want to look at how one brand in the world has done this, Coca-Cola, because I think they were one of the first big brands to understand the difference between social media and social business. So over the last few years, they've created a number of very innovative ways to make their product more inherently social, more inherently uh, shareable. So last year, they created a campaign in Australia where they printed 200 ordinary names onto Coke bottles and invited consumers to share them. And in fact, this won a Creative Effectiveness Award at Cannes this year because it generated such a spike in sales in Australia in the previous year. So this year, they added a new dimension to making their product shareable. Take a look. A brand new day has begun. The first thing that I want to do, make sure that you feel it too. So I'm not the only one. So that's really a snapshot of all the conversations that took place at, at Cannes this year, my sort of curated version of that conversation. Um, and so with all of that in mind, I want to sum up with, with one quote and one traditional TV commercial. And the quote is from Lee Clow, who's one of the kind of original madmen of our industry. He invented this, the Apple brand along with Steve Jobs. He said, wake up every morning, love what you do, and have the courage to create a big idea. Or as Axe says, fear no Susan Glenn. I remember her. Not a girl, but the girl. The brains behind the all-time top ten comic book vixens only wish they could conjure a siren the likes of Susan Glenn. Beneath my feet, my own private earthquake registered an eight when Susan Glenn was near. In her presence, all that was beautiful before she arrived turned grotesque. And in her shadow, others became goblin-esque. If she approached, Susan Glenn didn't walk. She floated, accompanied by pyrotechnic spectacles that left me feeling a foot tall. She embodied every desirable quality I'd ever wanted. In my mind, I was a peasant before a queen. And so Susan Glenn and I were never a thing. If I could do it again. I'd do it differently. In other words, seize the opportunities that present themselves. Get up every day, love what you do, and have the courage to create a big idea. Fear no Susan Glenn. That's Can in a Can. Thank you very much.